Hi there, this is Penelope Spheris, and you are listening to Appetite for Distortion with Brando on iHeartRadio. is Appetite for Distortion. And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 156. My name is Brando. Momentarily, we will be speaking with an icon of, of filmmaking, Penelope Spheris, who has done the Decline of Western Civilization trilogy. She has done Wayne's World, Black Sheep, so many films that we're going to talk to her about. Of course, we're going to talk about Guns N' Roses as well. But before we get to her, uh, we need to speak with our co-host for the day. Uh, you may know him. He's been on before or, or read one of his many articles, whether it be on AL.com or Rolling Stone or Billboard, Guitar World. Matthew Wake, welcome back. Mr. Brando, thanks for having me, man. This is exciting. Penelope Spheris. I'm I'm shocked. I mean, that I she was just so responsive. I, I talk about because I'm pretty uh, forthcoming coming on this podcast, whether like last episode I thanked you for being uh the catalyst for for Pauly Shore. Guns and Roses. So you kind of helped me along. And, and of course, he still had to say yes, but you kind of gave me the first initial contact. Or if, like, so like one of the, the shorter interviews that I get, the 10 minute ones, they're usually through my job. Uh, but a lot of the, of course, these I get myself. So all I did was send her an email. And I you mm. know, told her about the show and some of my past guests. And she got back to me, I feel like 20 minutes later, and, and was just totally mm. down and was totally into it. And she said, can we do it this Sunday? Because next Sunday I'm receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> so, okay, sure. So uh, even though it's a week early, we're, we're going to have our first official Lifetime Achievement Award winner uh, on the show. And after we speak with Penelope about you know all things you know punk rock and Sunset Strip and, and Wayne's World. Show Wing. <laughs> I have more sound bites for her coming up. Uh, before we, we do that, uh, I mean, excuse me, after we do that, we're going to talk to you about your upcoming article on Guitar World, which concerns Guns N' Roses. And I think listeners definitely want to stick around for that part because you're going to be talking about a couple of eras of GNR that does not get highlighted as much as they should, right? Oh, totally. And uh, it's part of the picture that completes the uh, story. Beautiful. So uh, I can't wait to talk about that, but... We got to talk to the the star of the show right now, uh, Penelope Spheris. So let's give her a call. Hi, Penelope. This is uh, Brandon or Brando, however you if you're more comfortable. Oh, Brando, I like that. <laughs> well, if you like it, I'll go by by Brando. See, I I don't know. I'm my obviously my my birth name is Brandon, and when I got uh-huh. into radio, Brando sounded cooler than just being called Brandon Weisler, Jewish kid from Long Island. So. No, I love Brando. Let's go with that. All right, perfect. I guess don't introduce myself that way because I'm not as cool as some of these rock stars that you've worked with. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Is Matt going to join us? Matt, you can say hello. Hey, hey, Penelope. Matt Wake here. I uh, hope you're doing well. Hi. Doing very well. Thank you. There was a fire in our neighborhood yesterday, and um, they got it out, thank God. But um, I, I just want to apologize if... My uh, voice craps out because the smoke really was bad. <clears throat> oh, wow. So, Did you have to evacuate or anything like that? No, I got the fire department alerts here on my phone, and, you know, um, it was over by, uh, Burbe- uh, you know, um, Universal City, and uh, it was a pretty big fire, 40 acres or something. Wow. Uh, but I live in Laurel Canyon, and one of those fires... You know, goes. Well, I heard it, it traveled ten miles in an hour. Jesus Christ, that's faster than I drive. You know. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm, I'm glad and, you're safe. Oh yeah, we're we're good. But I'm just saying, my voice is a little wonky. No, no, it's it, it's quite all right. So uh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate you 
taking the time out to speak with <clears throat> with Matt and I, and I have an appropriate because uh, obviously this is I, even though it's a podcast, I treat it like a like a radio show, so I have the appropriate soundbite for for Matt and I. We're not mental or anything, so don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I try. I, love it. I try. So I, I again, I can't thank you enough because you truly are an icon of the of the industry. Uh, just well, thank you. The, the person you are, the things that you've accomplished, um, and what's amazing. What's, I couldn't help but but think to myself as we're recording this, uh, November tenth. So next week you're receiving a lifetime achievement award. Yeah, I get. I'm uh, in uh, this place uh, in Santa Barbara. They're having a, a pretty large festival, uh, and I am the person receiving the. Lifetime Achievement Award, and I think last year it was Jeff Bridges. So they're serious about this, you know. Oh wow! So wow, you're up there. Um, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. This is a hot take. I think you're more important than the dude. I think you're more important. Oh my God, that's hilarious! <laughs> no, the dude's more important than me for sure. God damn man! I don't. Oops. Uh, I don't. Um, <laughs> I weird. don't have a brown bath ro- robe, but I do need one. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. That's what I said. Matt, I said to her, she's like, "Oh, they're they're already putting me in the grave." And no, I think it's <laughs> it's something that's uh, well deserved. So to have an, a lifetime and short, uh, achievement award winner on the show, and it is uh, well deserved. I was just telling Matt off the air, and this isn't me blowing smoke. This is uh, this is me, Brandon, talking honestly. Uh, both Wayne's World and the decline of Western Civilization Part Two, the Metal Years, completely changed my course in life. Like they, oh my God! They've completely ch- shaped the kind of person I am. Do you, do you get that a lot? <clears throat> That's the thing is, they ask me, "Oh, what questions do you want to talk? You know, what do you want to ask uh, us to ask you for the when you receive the award?" And um, and I said, "Well, one thing that really every time I hear it, I get a tear in my eye, uh, is that people say that um, some of my films change their lives." And, you know, gosh, I, I had no idea when I was doing them. Uh, but for them to have that effect is just so gratifying, you know? I remember, because what was interesting, because I rewatched one and two last night, and I had to go to go to sleep before I finished uh, three. But it's interesting when you were filming three and you started out by asking all the people you interviewed if they watched the first one about punk. Because that one was, what, yeah. like 79, 80 and yeah. uh, the, the third one was mid nineties, no. so that's like, ninety seven. Yeah, yeah. So that was more towards my era. So I was not born during the the first one, or yeah, the second one. I was too young. I was born in in, in eighty three. So I didn't wow see decline two until my college years. Uh-huh. Uh, so you know two thousand one something like that, and uh-huh. you know so I didn't grow up with the Sunset Strip. I grew up with just stories. So this was the closest I can get to it. And again, it wasn't just being amazed by all these bands that I loved, you know, the, the Poisons and, and Kiss. And, but it was just the, the way that it was shot, the way that you interview people, whether, you know, huge stars like Ozzy or, or <laughs> Lemmy. But then you got people who was never made it, who were so convinced they were going to make it. Yeah. And the, the line... If there is one between success and failure, like what was the difference? What was your, I guess, goal when you were filming it? In, in addition to just being entertainment, like what what was the goal to show? What was the message you wanted to get across uh, in all your films, not just two? Well, all the documentaries. I, you know, having had a brother who was a struggling musician, and um, so many friends who have tried to make it in the um, music business. What I wanted to do with the Decline movies is to show unknown bands and, and highlight them to give them a chance, but then give them a boost with people who were already well-known, you know, like Kiss and Poison and Lemmy and blah, blah, you know. And so my goal really was to help the unknown bands. So I guess that was the reason I made the films, and plus I, I have to say I think about myself as something of a anthropologist, you know, I mean, I really love to study uh, human behavior and try and understand why people 
especially young people, do what they do. Mm. And uh, that's what I was doing with the first decline. It's like when punk came around, everybody was like, well, geez, we don't even want to go and talk to these people because they're so frightening. <laughs> so I just wanted to dive in and show the world that they weren't that frightening. See, that's what I, I got, but it became something else. Like, did you really think that, like, Odin was going to be the next big thing to poison, you know, with the assless chaps? And Because I, I watch it now in 2019, <laughs> and I'm like, it, it seems like it's Spinal Tap, but it was real. These were real well, bands. I, I didn't know. I mean, I certainly can't predict the future, I don't think, uh, correctly 100% of the time. None of us can. Um, I, so I didn't know what was going to happen with these bands. I knew I loved Faster Pussycat, you know. Uh, Odin was a band that uh, played the strip really a lot. And you never, and they acted like they, acted like they were going to make it as big as Guns N' Roses, yeah. for example. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about that time is there was this philosophy that if you believed it, it would happen, um, which kind of is stupid because uh, that ain't true. Uh, and to this day, I think there are a lot of people that if I just think it, it'll happen. No, you're not God. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like, do. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Just because you think it don't mean it's going to happen. You know, that's cause yeah. Matt and I, we, we talk about uh, a lot of 80s metal, the hair metal, and you mentioned Faster Pussycat. And I'm watching the performance last night that's on the documentary. I'm like, there's such a fine line between them and Guns N' Roses, the way that they're yeah, dressed, right. the way that they acted. But so what's, what was the difference? Like, what do you think is the difference between, uh, maybe as you reflect, why some bands made it? Uh, to the, a certain because Faster is still successful, but they didn't hit the yeah. major success. Is there it, something you look you know, back what, on, Br Mr. Brando? I'm going to tell you something. It's all about the songwriting. When it comes right yeah. down to it, you know, when it comes right down to it, it's it it it's got to be. It's just like with a movie. It's got to be about the script. If it's a great script, you know then you have a chance at making a, 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 a um, classic movie, a movie that people are going to love to see. If it's a great song, you've got a band that's going to stick around for a while. So it really is about, I think, the, the songwriting. And that's not to say that Faster Pussycat didn't have great songs, because they did. I mean, I yeah. run around singing Bathroom Wall all day long, still <laughs> stuck in my head, you know. Um, but it just the caliber of music and songwriting for, that Guns N' Roses had at that time uh, was off the charts, you know. So speaking of Decline 2 and Faster, I uh, interviewed Tammy down from Faster uh, this year, and he had real fond years of making Decline 2. Uh, he loved getting to be friends with you and stuff. And, um, of course, some of the footage is shot at the Cat House, which was Tammy and uh, Ricky Rackman's uh, kind of infamous rock club back then. And you depict the, there's some performances there and some interviews. But to fill in between those two kind of, like, uh, depictions, what was it like in the Cat House? in the 80s that you can recall, if you had to sum that up, describe it. And then second to that, from Decline 2, do you have a good story? I know everybody asked you about Chris Holmes in the pool, but I wonder if you have a good story about Ozzy cooking the eggs in well, his... Well, hold on a minute, because, you, you know, you got to remember, I'm, uh, I'm a lot older than you, and if you give me too many questions at one time, I'm going to scramble them up. Okay? So let's, let's, let's start with your first question, Matt. Uh, that yeah, yeah. has to do with uh, Cat House, right? So yeah, totally. I, I, I can describe to you what the Cat House was like um, in two words. Pure debauchery, okay? Um, it was like, I don't know if you know what in the Caligula. Well, okay, it, <laughs> it was everything that you can imagine that people weren't supposed to be doing in a public place was going on. Okay, and it's funny you mentioned Ricky because he's such a sweetheart. And he um, <laughs> he said to me one time, he goes, you know, uh, if you hadn't have put me in the uh, decline too, I probably never would have hosted uh, Headbangers Ball. 
And I thought, well, you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad I was able to help with somebody's career like that. You know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were naked women running around pretending to drop their bra and then putting it back on. There were, there was cocaine flying left and right. There was pot smoked everywhere. I mean, uh, vomit on the floor. Um, uh, everybody was just like, uh, it was like a porno movie. Uh, <laughs> it was like a porno movie. You know what I mean? It's like, whoa! I cannot believe that girl is not wearing. Uh, anything but pasties, you know? (laughs) How do they pass health inspection every month? How did that happen? (laughs) Well, I think the health inspectors liked being there. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fair point. (laughs) Uh, Matt, you had a second call. Oh, yeah, the uh, uh, Chris Holmes. I'm watching that uh, that part last night to jump off uh, Matt's question. And it's hard for me not to be like a Jewish mother and make sure people are okay. You know, if they have right. the sniffles. So, do you have any? You Me know, too. Do you have a cough drop? Are you okay, sweet blah, blah, blah? Yeah, I go get the chicken soup. Yes. So, I mean, sometimes you would interview somebody and, and ask them, you know, where do you think? Like you did with Chris. Where's the anger come from? Were you scared for them? Was there anything that you really kind of wanted to take control and not be like a therapist or do an intervention, or were you just kind of, I got to let them be who they are, and I'm, I'm just purely here to document it. Oh, that's an interesting question, Brando. I'll tell you, um, I think if I had to pick between those two, even though I am the ultimate Jewish mother, hmm. uh, I would have to pick the second one. Because as a filmmaker, my goal is to objectively show what's going on and how people are behaving and let the audience decide what they think about it. You know, I did not tell Chris Holmes to bring three bottles of vodka to that pool. I did not ask him to do that. I did not ask, um, you know, uh, uh, Gene Simmons to, to do his interview in a lingerie store. Um, Gene said he wanted to do the film, but he didn't want to do anything tacky. I said, okay, fine. What do you want to do? He goes, um, uh, well, how about we do it in trashy lingerie? I said, like, okay, fine. Uh, we're not doing anything tacky. Fine. <laughs> And then, um, you know, Paul wanted to uh, be in bed with uh, three or four girls. And I said, okay, we'll try to find you some girls. And um, so I had, I didn't have much money making that movie, as with most of them. And, and so we got some girls, uh, and Paul took me aside, and he goes, I'm sorry, but those girls are, are not, they're not very attractive, and one of them's ugly, you know? It's like, <laughs> wait a minute, uh, what am I going to do? I can't just pull girls out of my ear, you know? What are we going to do here? He goes, hold on a minute, and he goes and calls the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> and then, so these, the Playboy girls come over, and that's, uh, that's where we got those girls. But to answer your question about, um, about Chris, um, no, I mean, I got my own family members I try to save. You know what I mean? It, it's okay. like if Chris wants to behave like that, especially with his own mother sitting there, Sandy, then I'll have to let him do that, you know? And he actually was pissed at me for years uh, because of the interview. And I'm like, dude, I didn't ask you to bring the vodka. I didn't ask you to act like a dipshit. I didn't ask you to show how you know, screwed up rock and roll life could be, but you did it, you know. I don't think he's mad anymore, though. Mm. Uh, I guess... Certain age, yeah. Two questions in there, and I forgot, Matt, you mentioned the Aussie cooking the egg, so we will get to that. Uh, Oh, yeah. But before we lose it, with Paul Stanley, was it your... I I got to imagine as director, was it your decision to shoot that from above and look down at him? Oh, yeah. See, it's brilliant. Just yeah, brilliant. No, those kind yeah. of decisions are mine. I mean, how are you going to get an angle on a bed where you could see all the people that are in the bed unless you're just right on top of it, you know? And so the um, shooter, uh, d- uh, director of photography, Jeff Zimmerman, um, suggested that we get some uh, two-by-fours and lay them across this um, staircase balcony thing, put the bed underneath there, and shoot straight down. And I went, hey, Zimmerman, you did it again. Thank you. Just brilliant. That's what I was alluding to before. It's not just the subject matter. It's just the way everything is shot and the angles uh, for me is, since I saw it, has always been kind of the standard of what I want from documentaries. So many of them just seems to be 
uh, seem to have the kind of the same formula and and not take risks, uh, you know, shooting wise. Uh, so yeah, what what Matt mentioned before with the Aussie and the cooking, I forgot, and and maybe this is something that you do, I guess, because in the first one you kind of had something similar with Darby from the Germs when he was cooking bacon and uh, in his very very dirty kitchen. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that something you, you wanted to do, just get a rock star in that, that environment to cook breakfast, or that kind of just well, happened? Uh, w- what happened was, you know, Darby Crash was kind of hard to, to to wrangle. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, Darby, um, we've got this performance that you did, and now I would like to have an interview with you, so where could we do it? And then he would, like, turn around and walk away. You know, it's like, <laughs> dude, I'm asking you a question, you know. So finally, one morning, uh, I called his apartment, and uh, my friend Michelle was there. She's the girl in the kitchen with him. And um, I said, look, I really want to do this interview. I've got the equipment. Uh, Let me just come over and do it. And Darby said, well, if you could bring us some breakfast, um, you know, I'll do the interview. I'm like, awesome. So I went down to Ralph's. I bought some bacon and eggs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> some um uh what do you call that green jelly looking stuff uh mint jelly mm. and um brought it over there and i figured well hell let him cook the breakfast and i'll interview him and then after that it's, it's kind of a running theme in all three decline movies right. because then we had ozzy doing the eggs uh and he's yep. a terrible cook don't you think just one of the greatest scenes in, in cinematic history is Ozzy and his frosted tips cooking uh, cooking eggs. And he was so funny. He was just so funny when you ask him, uh, you know, are you okay now? Because he's talking about you get, uh, you, you, you're getting over the drugs and all that. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. So anything, uh, what Matt was uh, asking, anything special you remember from, from filming with Ozzy or, and that scene specifically? Well, Ozzy and I uh, and Sharon were friends before um, I did decline. Um, we had actually been trying to get a movie started where Ozzy would star in the movie. It was called Shooting Stars. And... There was, and it was a comedy about a failing rock star, and it was a great script. And this guy, David Beagleman, who was a kind of old-school Hollywood producer, was going to produce it. And so Ozzy and Sharon and I would go and see David and talk about doing the movie. And, and then David took me aside, and he goes, Penelope, I don't think Ozzy's funny. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> Ozzy's fucking hilarious. Excuse my, you should beep that. Okay, You're Ozzy okay. is hilarious. Okay. And, um, and nobody would believe me, okay? Well, uh, cut, you know, cut two years later, look at the Osbournes. Is Ozzy funny or what, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. You know, but here's a, here's, here's, here's a good one. Every time I see Ozzy now, okay, what happened with Beagleman, I don't know, because he had a hard life, he had... Troubles with his wife, blah, blah, money problems. Ultimately, that guy, and I don't remember the year, but he he committed suicide in the Century Plaza Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, now, after that, every time I see Ozzy, the first thing he says to me is, Penelope, how come that guy shot himself in the head because he couldn't do a movie with us? (laughs) (laughs) Something you want to be reminded of all the time. I'm like... Yeah, right. I'm like, Ozzy, that's not why he did it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, Oh my God. Terrible. I mean, obviously, we can spend so much time uh, dissecting the the whole Decline trilogy. uh, But I know you you, I appreciate the time you're giving us this this morning, uh, waking up early on a Sunday. So uh, but in the Decline, I do need to, I guess, this is the transitional point. Uh, Guns N' Roses is mentioned, but they're not in the film per se. So was that a a choice not to have them in, uh, I guess? And you also mentioned it in the email to specifically remind you about the first time that oh, you met Slash. Oh, let's that first question there, because uh, with regard to GNR being in Decline 2, they were, they were, you know, a millimeter away from being in the movie, 
Um, I was speaking mostly with Slash, but sometimes with uh, Axel about them doing the film. And they were going to be the closing act in Decline 2. Wow. And so, Hmm. yeah, it was all set. It was all set up. And I even saw Slash recently in... um, Whenever I see him, he apologizes that they weren't in the movie. I'm like, dude, it's okay, man. I got Megadeth. We're cool. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, what happened was their, their manager, uh, I think his name was Alan Niven, uh, came down to the set. He had to go see the set where we were going to shoot Guns N' Roses for Decline 2. So he, he comes down there, and he looks at it, and he goes, oh, okay, yeah, it looks good. It was a cave with some weird lighting and some smoke and blah, blah, very, you know, uh, heavy metal 80s. And um, then the next thing I know, uh, I get a call. He, the, the band's not going to do the movie. Why? It, it doesn't matter. But I know why now. The reason is because when you got a band on a roll, Okay, you don't do anything to screw it up. Mm-hmm. So it's always like that. That's the way managers are. Huh. You won't let them do anything else if you got a good role going, and they had a good role going at that point. Mm-hmm. That explains the, their kind of philosophy why they don't do much now. <laughs> if if it's going well, just uh, leave it alone. And that- well, hell, you know, I excuse me for interrupting, no, but I was trying to uh, do something where I would have to interview Greg Ginn from Black Flag, and he wouldn't. He doesn't do an interview. He doesn't do any interviews anymore. Okay, and it, it's the same kind of principle, really. You know, if you got something going, don't do anything to screw it up. And uh, Greg is not a good talker. He's a genius guitar player, a genius songwriter, performer. But he ain't good at talking. So he figured that out finally, so he don't talk now. Um, but that's what happens is the managers just control them like that. Because huh, I was, yeah. was going to ask why you chose Megadeth to be the last performance, because I found that interesting, too, because they were so different than everybody else. Well, uh, honestly, Brando, if I would have... Uh, was that Brando talking? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. If I were to have had my way about Decline 2, there would have been far fewer fluffy uh, glam bands in there. There would have been more, um, what shall I say, have real heavy metal. Um, and, you know, it, w- it, it would have been more bands like Megadeth or, or, or Motorhead or just uh, harder bands, you know. But the, I wasn't paying for that movie. I didn't have any money at that point. I hadn't directed Wayne's World. I got... I became a millionaire overnight when I directed Wayne's World, but but before that I was broke, you know. So uh, I I really didn't have, um, and I you know whatever. I I, I just it, it it's been a rough road here to, uh, trying to explain how, what bands are in there and why. But uh, I would I got Megadeth at the last minute because I was able to produce the guy with the money that I needed a, a heavier band in there. Well, I mean, it still worked out to be uh, iconic, so it, it it is what it was, or it was what it was. Um, it is what it is. It is what it is, right? So before we, you know, I, we of course we got some Wayne's World questions too, but we can't forget about because uh, you told me to remind you about the first time that you met Slash. Like what what happened? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Thanks for remembering. Um, actually, uh, it was. On the corner of Fairfax and Melrose, there's a, um, it was a magazine stand, you know, that was open uh, with all the magazines out in front. And then you go inside and there's a whole bunch of more magazines and, and a guy at the counter. And I drove by and I looked in casually and there was a guy at the counter with a top hat on and real, you know, really long hair of the time. And so I turned around. I had, to, I had to meet this guy. I turned around and parked, and I went inside, and I bought a magazine, and I had, you know, checked him out. And uh, he wasn't even in Guns N' Roses yet. <laughs> wow. um, but he was, he was working in a magazine stand on the corner there. Wow. I mean, you, you had to have jobs before you. I guess, uh, you know, you, you make it, of course. That's crazy. Well, yeah, exactly. Of course, and um, you know, he just had that—he just had that rock star look that uh, 
I mean, that's how I decide which films I'm going to do. I'm just driving down the street, you know, and I see mm. stuff. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of uh, Wayne's World, I'm curious, or actually before that, um, I read recently, Penelope, you're done with Hollywood, but I'm curious, would you be interested if, say, something like Netflix gave you a chance to do a decline for, and what would you cover in a decline for without giving well, away that, a you know, that's the million-dollar question here. Uh, I'm already working on decline four. Nice. And awesome. I would not let anybody give me any money to do it because then I wouldn't own it. And I, I own the decline series, so, um, you know, I'm doing that movie already. I've just... The thing is, I've been <laughs> distracted by building houses. I, I really am good at building houses. <laughs> okay. What, you and you know, Jimmy I, Carter? I, are, you, are you hanging out with Jimmy Carter, building houses? What do you mean? Oh, oh, but no, but for my, I build him. He's, he's uh, a guy, I guess, got a bigger heart than me. He's Habitat for uh, Humanity, I believe, and I build him for myself and give him to my relatives. Oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> so all like HGTV kind of stuff? <laughs> yeah, well, no. Well, I guess Not to minimize it, I guess. <laughs> But uh, anyway, yeah, so I got seven houses. I've been working on the houses. But the fact of the matter is, you're right, I have no interest in Hollywood. Basically, Hollywood sucks. And no, you got to say the quote. Enough. You got to say your, the I'm, thing. We got to quote you for. Uh, and I'm, I'm. You said you can print this uh, in the last interview. You oh. did. <laughs> Hollywood, no. uh, according to Penelope, quote, they can blow me. Yeah, I said that. I know. <laughs> I love it. I had a couple of beers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I don't give a shit anymore, you know, and I'm so happy that I don't because I have so many friends who really care and really want to still be doing that, you know, and honestly, it was painful. It wasn't fun. It was not fun. It was not glamorous. I did not dig it. I made money doing it. I made a shitload of money doing it. But I didn't like it, you know? And I don't mean to be griping because, look, I got to make a lot of movies and a lot of people didn't. I, I made a lot of money and a lot of people didn't. So uh, I, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying I'm done with it. I don't need it anymore, you know? Do you even? I'd rather just live my life. But do you even need it? In today's day and age, because it's one thing when you were making documentaries in the 80s and 90s that you know, Hollywood is where it's at. But now everything is so DIY where people post movies on Facebook and, and do Kickstarters. Yeah. You, and you already have the name recognition. Do you even need Hollywood anymore? No, I guess that's why I opened my big mouth and said they can blow me because I <laughs> guess I, I mean, I don't need them. And I'm so happy that I don't because guess what? It, Hollywood attracts a bunch of creeps. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it does. You know? I mean, and it takes you a while to figure out you're dealing with a creep or a liar or, or a dishonest person, you know? Or, worst of all, an inept person that doesn't know what the hell he's doing, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I'm I'm over it. I'm done. I don't mean to sound bitter, but I'm just done with it, you know? You don't sound bitter. You just sound okay. like you're being honest. I'm happy. And happy. I am actually happy about it, yeah. <laughs> We'd be remiss if we didn't ask some Wayne's World uh, questions real quick, Penelope. So yeah. a lot of people, the Alice Cooper cameo is so uh, fantastic in Wayne's World. I was curious if there were any other um, huge rock stars that didn't end up being in the movie that came close or were talked about as uh, potential Lee for some other cameo. What a great question. It is. What a great question. And I have the answer. Okay, so Mike Myers really, really wanted Aerosmith to be in the first Wayne's World, okay? Mm. Because he had worked with them on, the, on Saturday Night Live and everything. And so I guess they read the script and... Um, you know that so, that whole theory I had going a while ago of if you if you're on a roll don't do anything to screw it up. Well, they uh, Aerosmith decided they didn't want to be in the movie. Okay, they want to be in Wayne's in the first Wayne's World. So I had just worked with Alice on uh, Decline Two, 
And so I asked Alice to do it. He said he would, and of course he did a spectacular job. He always mm-hmm. he always uh, comments on the fact that he thought he just had to perform, but then when he got there, the writers wrote like two pages about Algonquin, uh, you know. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Millie and Wake. To, uh, yeah, in the Millie Wake, and he... He had to memorize like two pages of dialogue, which, you know, musicians, they don't have to do that. Um, but he did it, and he's all, he was all very proud that he did it, and he should have been. Um, but, you know, uh, the funny part was that I didn't get the gig to do uh, Wayne's World 2. Another reason why I love Hollywood. Uh, but in Wayne's World 2, Mike got Aerosmith. And that movie kind of bombed. So that was ironic. Hmm. I I enjoyed the sequel, but it's not the first one. It's it's just no, the no, first no, one no. is uh is yeah. part of a uh, cinematic uh, lore. Yeah, when I didn't history. get the job to do that second film, I I sat in my house and tore all the phones out of the wall uh-huh. uh, and cried for two weeks. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Uh, how is and if I, I may ask, because Matt and I are both curious, if there were in, in this world of reboots and sequels, and there's so many outlets for it. Is your relationship with uh, Mike Myers good enough to potentially do uh, a third movie or anything? Well, if he didn't give me, if if he if he wanted me to not do the second movie, he'd look pretty stupid if he asked me to do the third movie. Plus, I mean, aren't they a little old now? <laughs> they hate. Look, they did Fuller House, so I don't know. Wayne and Garth could be parents. You never know. Teach a right. No, a lot of people ask about a third Wayne's World, but it's really up to Paramount Pictures. You know. Okay, I figured I'd ask. And before it okay. it, it, it escapes, uh, do you have? Well, I mean, do you have? Of course, you have. What's the the subject matter for Decline Four, or is that a secret? Well, it's a bit of a secret. Thank you for being so considerate as to ask. Um, it's a bit of a secret because. Everybody's got an iPhone these days, and everybody could go out and do the movie. Um, mm. But I, um, they can't do it like me. I don't Smart. think. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I will disclose the subject matter soon. I believe so. Anyway, we've been working on it for oh God, year and a half, two years now. But like I said, building houses keeps getting in the way. Okay. Well, I have to move my editing room too many times. <laughs> hey, uh, whatever. It's uh, however long it takes. I'm looking forward to it. And I was thinking oh. about that that last night. I'm like, what subject could she do if she was going to do a fourth one? And Matt, I don't know if you have any ideas. And, and you don't have to respond to these, uh, yay or nay, Penelope. But I'm like, what, what if she what if she did a documentary on all the the Lil uh, hip hop artists? Everyone named Lil. Why is that a thing? I know everybody thinks I should, but the fact of the matter is, I was offered when I was broke. I was offered a million dollars to do um, the the rap years. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And because I'm not good at rap music and I don't I'm not into it That's you have to love a subject matter if you're going to make a movie about it yes okay, okay. And, and God bless all you people that love rap music it just ain't my thing so I I, I didn't do it and and the, and the little kids now it's it's basically rap with know? the SoundCloud rappers or the white kids with like, all the SoundCloud yeah, they, yeah with all the tattoos, tattoos in their face. On their face yeah yeah all that stuff uh, I'm just not into the sound of the music. Okay. It's like a cross between punk and, and rap, but I think, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to slip and tell you what the movie's about if I'm not careful here. Okay. So, all right. So then we'll, we'll keep it there. So we'll, we'll keep it uh, safe. But no, the fact that you're just moving, uh, working on a fourth one, uh, I, I just can't wait for it. Um, oh, cool. Do you know the outlet that I made is it, or we, was, we can't, you're not even thinking about that yet. If it's going to be like on your website, well, if it's going to be streaming on a popular service, you know, what's funny is whenever I made the decline movies, I never knew what distribution they would have with any of them. And that doesn't bother me. You know, for me, it's just all about making the movie and getting her done, you know? And, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but, uh, in 2017, the first decline, was inducted into the Library of Congress National Film Registry. Nice. So uh, it will be around for future generations to see. Isn't that cool? 
As it should be. They are all, I believe, like required viewing. You know, at the time, uh-huh. I was able to watch because they would be in rotation on VH1 when they would actually have uh, music programming. But now, you know, they, they, there's places you can go and see it, Amazon or whatever. But yeah. I, I try to find the free websites. I'm just being honest with you. That, uh, that, yeah. That, that, <laughs> um, I, I don't blame you, man. Uh, I know I don't want to keep you for too much longer. I know you have more uh, houses to build and lifetime achievement awards to get. <laughs> Uh, if you can name like a band that you've worked or that you filmed in the decline series that per- perhaps that maybe you you thought maybe were would get out of control or you were worried about filming because again I'm 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 watch I'm rewatching the first two specifically yesterday you know and maybe not the hair metal I mean Odin can get kind of crazy or fashion can get crazy but some of those punk bands like the Germs like Fear. I mean, was there yeah. any time where you were like, "Whoa, this is this is g- going to go beyond the film, and this is going to be something something bad's going to happen"? You know what? Um, the, the thing that you're describing did, in fact, happen to me when I made a movie about Two Live Crew. Okay. Um, in the '90s, yeah, I was in a, 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 a venue called the Longhorn in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. And I was supposed to be shooting two life, and the uh, Luther Campbell uh, wanted to get paid before he went on stage, and the the management wouldn't pay him before he went on stage, and the the um, audience and there must have been two three hundred people there, uh, they tore the place up, and I I shoot one camera, so I had to crawl out of that place on my hands and knees, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I've been in situations where, uh, yeah, total destruction was going on. <laughs> but I keep shooting. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, again, what – I don't want to say again. Maybe it's why you're, you're – I'm bouncing off you being fed up with Hollywood, and I think a lot of it has to do with the treatment of women. And it's something I came across was how, like, Wayne's World was listed in this top thing of uh, female directors. I'm like, why does it have to be female? It's just a great fucking movie. That reminds me of the time that I get a call from somebody at Vanity Fair, and they go, we're going to do a cover of all women film directors. Will you come and be in that shot? And I said, well, when are you going to do the cover of all the men directors? Why do you keep separating us? Yeah. You know? mm. So... You find people finally starting to get that, you know. There ain't no difference, man. We're both just directors, you know. I, yeah, yeah, the only time it really crossed my mind because you can't tell obviously from the filming because it's not like you're using a a pink filter to be stereotypical or, or right. Uh, was just when you were in those what I thought were dangerous situations, and I'm like, okay, she's there. She's she's a a small woman or a small girl, you know, young girl at the time, or these you know crazy drunk rock stars trying to take advantage. Uh, I, those things crossed my mind, but everyone who did an interview, at least on camera, seemed to come across it like they were talking to their friend. So I, uh, mm. you... Yeah, most of the time I was friends with them, you know? Like, people go, how did you infiltrate that punk rock uh, scene? I'm like, I didn't have to infiltrate him, man. I just I was part of it, you know? Okay. And I was just the one that happened to have the camera. I had a film company back then called Rock and Reel, and I was doing music videos before anyone else in L.A. was doing them, before, way before MTV. And... Um, I had the equipment, so I was the one that was doing the filming. You know, I just lucked out that way. But I didn't have to, like, go underground and pretend I was a punk. And do, 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 do. <laughs> I was already there, you know? Well, Penelope, you are an icon, uh, a, leg- a legend in, in, the, in the industry <laughs> and as a, as a person. <laughs> and anyone, again, if you go from, you know, directing things that have changed, not just my life, but many people's lives, Matt's life, and then today you can just go to Hollywood blow me it's just your i think you're you're, <laughs> you're uh you're, you're a role model i think in, in a lot of different ways so. oh i got a little tear in my eye from that one brando oh. thank you well thank you for all the, the wonderful work and of course the the time this morning i know it's uh it's early it's early for me here on the east coast so i know it's er- even earlier for you on the west coast uh, oh no hell no i get up at six o'clock man the the construction guys come in at seven we're good we're uh, good right on uh <laughs> Before we let Penelope go, Matt, do you have anything that you would want to ask her while we got her? Well, uh, likewise, I want to thank you, Penelope, for your work and for this conversation and time. Um, and But beyond that, I'm curious. So you talked about earlier about, you know, 
uh, meeting Slash when he was working at the uh, magazine stand and people have to work jobs coming up. You were working as a waitress at Denny's and IHOP, I'd read, to put yourself through film school. Do you have any cool or funny story about any stars or famous musicians or people that you waited on, perhaps, at that Denny's or IHOP? Well, that's a really weird question, but uh, I think interesting. Um, I was working in uh, Costa Mesa in uh, Westminster, Orange County, and so there were absolutely no rock stars, to, <laughs> rock stars or famous people down there. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of punk rock bands that came out of Orange County, but um, I will say I always had the feeling when I was working in those restaurants that there was something better in life. There was something more that I was meant to do. And I remember the day I quit and I was walking out of the restaurant and I had that apron with a gigantic bow in the back, you know, and I took that apron and I threw it in the big dumpster trash can and I went, I'm done with this crap. And that's when I started, uh, that's when I chose to go to film school. So, I mean, awesome. you, you, you did it the, the hardworking way. It wasn't like you were an overnight success. I mean, oh yeah. I, mean, I didn't go to Beverly Hills high school. Nobody paid my way. No, you know? absolutely not. And, um, I mean, I'm asking this for, for Matt because Matt's from Alabama. He writes for an Alabama uh, Alabama public, publication, and you lived there for a little while, right? I lived all over the South. I was born in a carnival. Uh, um, uh, my father owned, and uh, yeah, my sister was born in Yazoo City, Mississippi, and I was born in uh, Algiers, Louisiana, and uh, my father was killed in Montgomery, or actually Troy, mm, Alabama. Sorry, and. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, so um, there you go. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the South. My mama, I call her a shit kicker. <laughs> <laughs> when are you putting out a book? When are you doing a documentary about yourself? I actually Ooh. have spoken with a young man uh, that writes for the New York Times and uh, RogerEbert.com, and I believe he's going to be writing a book with me about my uh, roller coaster life. <laughs> Wow, I, I can't wait to read it, and I hope you come back on when it's uh, when it's out. Oh yeah, that would be cool. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and one more soundbite as we leave you. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're scum. We're scum. Oh my god, you guys, listen, party on. Okay, thank you so much. Party on. Party on, Penelope. She is as sweet and nice and as honest as I really thought she was going to be from her interviews, from the way she directs. It's just, I mean, she is who she is, and I, I'm certainly not disappointed with this interview at all. Not that I thought I would be, but just, try, as I told her, like an icon, really, in this industry. Oh, totally. And you think of the different types of stuff from, like, the gritty uh decline stuff to like uh, a comedy like Wayne's World to the, her early uh, kind of pioneering work in music videos like and uh, I'm psyched we're going to get a decline four too man me too I, I wasn't expecting her to because I have to imagine she gets asked that all the time but I hadn't read anything about it and it's I, I like the fact that we're going to be surprised and her reasoning makes a lot of sense even though she would do the subject matter better than everybody else you don't want the subject matter out there at all and potentially ruin anything for her. But the fact that she's going to do that, and, and it's also, I don't know, I maybe one day we'll get Mike Myers on here. We'll ask him why he didn't go with her for the, <laughs> for the second movie because you need to, re I don't know. I mean, yeah, who wants to see an old Wayne and Garth? But they did it on SNL. They, they've done it on, I think, accepting awards. So there's been like little bits here and there. They did it on that big uh, SNL 40th anniversary thing. That might have been uh, even like the opening bit, if I can remember correctly. But oh, okay. It just just in today's day and age, if you put like a quick little movie on Netflix, it's it's not that big of a deal. It's not like a box office bomb, you know, so to speak. I mean, look how many movies Adam Sandler has on there. And I'm an Adam Sandler fan, but they're not all winners. But he keeps putting his shit out on Netflix and... I'm sorry, if you can put out Fuller House and half this shit that goes on there, you can, uh, I can't imagine a Wayne's World 3 would be unsuccessful. It could be awkward. I don't know if I would go the uh, the route of releasing it in movies or TV, like the rebooted 90210 was already canceled. 
So I don't know if I would do mm-hmm. that. But it's like a one-off, you know, movie. Maybe not even. Maybe not like a whole. I don't know. You can get so creative with it. It doesn't even have to be like a whole hour and a half or whatever. It can just be like a a continuation. They can do like a Breaking Bad, El Camino, a Wayne's World movie. But uh, we'll see. But the fact that, again, uh, working on four is uh, I'm excited for it. And thanks, man, for I appreciate you, uh, you know, chiming in and, and being a part of the interview because I know you're as big of a fan of that era as uh, as I am. Oh, you bet. Hey, thanks for letting me ride shotgun. It's fun. Always fun. Of course, and before, what well, was also fun? Before we get out of here, news. Brought to you by AlternativeNation.net. So the news. I don't know how much you can update us, Matthew, but I know you've uh, tweeted it and uh, and put it on Facebook. So I know it's not a, a secret completely, but you're working on an article uh, for about Guns N' Roses for Guitar World, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it's been filed. It is about. An era that uh, not many people write about guns, and that is live era, the double album and uh, the double concert album and also Spaghetti uh, incident, which is interesting because they were each released on the same day, November 6th, I believe, but Mm. like six years apart. Mm. Uh, So I talked with Gilby Clark, who was great. I talked with Jim Mitchell, who engineered a bunch of that stuff, as well as some of the stuff on Illusions. Talked with Michael Monroe, who uh, sings on Spaghetti on that great version of They Had Fun with Axel. Talked with your friend, Roberta Freeman, uh, who is on Live Era and did the Illusion tour. Um, Talked with Brian James, who was the guitar player for The Damned. Uh, GNR did the great version of uh, New Rose with Duff singing and how that uh, helped him out at the time. And uh, so those are some of the people I talked to for that. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I wanted to talk to Slash, but um, I, uh, his rep said she would circle back if they said yes. And alas, there was no circling, but Hey, (laughs) I get it. I get it. They're making a zillion dollars. Why take a chance of screwing anything up? Because, this was kind of a period where stuff was going from bad to worse as far as inner band relations with the stars. And, um, uh, I think they were pretty, uh, um, uh, anti during the live era kind of release time, which was, I think 99. Uh, so a slash was out of the band and all that stuff. But, uh, anyway, uh, it, to me, the Guns N' Roses picture, are those either of those albums, Appetite or Illusions or, you know, for um, hardcore fans, uh, Chinese democracy cult favorite? No, they're not. But the story isn't complete without those. And this, uh, and to me, what was interesting in listening to these albums, hardcore again, and I've listened to Live Era a lot, especially in the car. It's a fun album to Agreed. travel to. But, Agreed. But, um there's good stuff like 90, what, 95, 98% of bands that exist, probably 98% of the bands that exist would love to have these two albums in their catalog. And with GNR, it's like, nah, <laughs> you know, but because they have these towering things like Appetite, like Chinese, like Illusions. Uh, but in even Lies, it's controversial. So it even overshadows it, but those albums, but uh, I don't know, man. We're, we're uh, I hope we get another album. What, what, where do you think we are on that? Oh, I, I, it's going to come at some point because, you know, as we know for a fact now, because of all, you know, hashtag Guns N' Roses leak 2019, there's a lot of material that Axel was working on. Slash is always working on shit, you know, as proven with Miles Kennedy and the conspirators. Duff is always working on shit as proven by Loaded and, and now, more recently, Tenderness. So something is going to happen. Obviously, the, the key uh, phrase, as it has been, uh, is, is soon the word. <laughs> that I, I don't know. It's interesting that they're taking a little bit of a break now. Uh, they have, I think they have announced the Lollapalooza for next year. Um, it was, it's, not, it's not in this country. Uh, another version of Lollapalooza. So... And I don't know if that's going to be a continuation. If not, this lifetime is going to be forever, and a lifetime is my reoccurring, <laughs> my my reoccurring terrible joke. Uh, but I have to imagine something's going to happen because also, and I don't think that these were proven to be fake, but there, 
you see a lot of pictures of uh, of set lists, and all, I I've learned to say spoiler alert before I talk about anything with the set list. So I f- forgive uh, <laughs> to the listeners that I they've gotten angry at me for talking about the set list without saying spoiler alert. I apologize. Here it is. Uh, you've seen on the alt set list hard school, which yeah. is. Probably the the best of the leaked songs. It's a good song. So if that's true, new music is going to happen. Now it th- then begs the question: Is it going to be on uh, like a full album? Is it going to be like an EP? Are they going to release like a live version of Not This Lifetime with a couple of extra tracks, kind of like maybe what Motley Crue did with the Dirt? You know, a couple extra tracks. I think we just want new music at this point. You know, sometimes I sit back and think that the fact that we're in this scenario of Axel and Slash together again, not just with Duff, because Duff had gotten back together with Axel and, of yeah. course, Velvet Revolver with Slash, but it, the, the two key elements, at least to the, the, the majority of the public eye, the ones who yeah. people dress up as, for Halloween, <laughs> Axel and Slash, they are back together again. Well, we thought it was never going to happen, not in this lifetime, that <laughs> something will happen. I just, I'm just, i not going to pretend to be on the, on the inside because I, I don't know. They keep everything close to the chest. And, and in a way, uh, and I'm being honest, it, it makes me feel, because obviously I've tried to get Gilby Clark on the show, and sometimes he likes talking about GNR, sometimes he doesn't, so I'm a little jealous there. But then I'm like, okay, at least Slash will reject the great Matt Wake as well because I can't get him either. It's hard, and I, and I guess I get that. Uh, but I think at the same time, you really need to know the source of – it's not just doing a press junket. If you have the reputation of a Matt Wake or I would like to think of a Brandon Weisler or Brando whatever uh, that we've – I don't want to say earned, but maybe there's less trepida- uh, trepidation – to be interviewed by, uh, especially yours is print, you know, mine's podcast. You can always, you know, we can talk before if you're unhappy with something. It's like, I can get you in a gotcha moment. You can say, you know what, take that out. And I would do that. It's no problem. Uh, but again, I like to think that uh, something will happen. I just, I, I don't know when, but the fact that they're touring, I'm not going to complain too much, especially since, again, uh, spoiler alert with the, well, not spoiler, because it already <laughs> happened with the set list. Them adding Dead Horse, them adding Locomotive, the fact that they do Slither from Velvet Revolver, I, you know, uh, Shadow of Your Love. I mean, we're getting a lot. We're getting a lot from this band. So I'm not freaking out as much as other fans may. I mean, obviously I want new music, but for somebody who, who grew up not seeing, uh, the band was already broken up. You know, my first show, as I, I've mentioned before, previously, it was with Buckethead. So to go from that, which I was a fan of anyway, to at least having mom and dad back together again. I'm not going to complain too much. But to jump off, that, that being said, to talk about your article, I'm, I'm excited to read it because you're right. The, the, those live, the live album, absolutely, while well, driving, road trips all throughout college. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and you quote things from the live era, the way he, 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 he says things, you know, uh, the way he... He said certain things. He says in in Mr. Brownstone instead of the pause, he'll he'll curse. Uh, you know, it's obviously it's all right, which is a song that's never played. The one he plays before yeah. no, uh, November Rain. You know, hearing songs, the the move into the city is just the way how extended that is, as opposed to the way it was on Lies, is just brilliant. So it's a great album, and I've really learned to appreciate the Spaghetti Incident as I've gotten older. Because I guess you kind of grow up. I don't know how you Same. how you did that. I don't know. Sometimes if people just like start shitting on things, you just shit on it as well. Like uh, how people just shit on Saint Anger from Metallica, or the shit on uh, Nickelback, or the, the shit on Creed, and all of a sudden you just find yourself doing that. Like, but you go back and revisit, and like it's not that bad, you know. I, I yeah. like Creed. Nickelback's fine. Uh, Saint Anger was fine. It wasn't like you know Metallica, but I'm I'm not. I got caught up with the spaghetti incident, the jokes. It's in the uh, the FYE recycle bin, if you remember what FYE was. Yeah. Uh, but no, a lot of great, great tracks that I love the originals of. You know, it's, it's um, fucking fantastic. You know, especially for someone like you and I who love the old school punk rock. 
and they're playing. It's not they're covering the old school punk rock. They're covering fear, fear that was in Penelope's first documentary, and yeah. so it's just like it's they're really good songs. I think it just but though it just lends itself to even then we just wanted new music. It's like this is good, great job guys, but this this. We know what your potential is to create a new song and or an authentic Guns N' Roses song. You know, let's 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 work on that before we start doing the Seeker and <laughs> and covering other yeah. other songs. So, <laughs> like I, I love Wichita Lyman, uh, but we'd like to hear an original GNR song. So, um, so yeah, that's my roundabout way of just commenting on your article <laughs> and commenting <laughs> on, uh, on on new music. So. Um, so yeah, man. Any when when can we expect to to see that? When when can we expect to read that? On, uh, yeah, on so World? you know it is for a national print magazine. So there is those wheels grind a little slower than we're used to in our twenty four seven kind of digital world. But um, uh, I, it'll be worth the wait. And they gave me a, a another assignment to do. Uh, a uh, story on a certain 80s guitar god who disappeared, who's one of the most revered players of that time, particularly considering the uh, uh, his band wasn't Guns N' Roses, big or anything like that, but they were big, and he just has disappeared from the music business. Ooh. So, And I've had an industry friend who connected me with him, so uh, hopefully that will go as planned. Awesome. No, I can't wait for, for both of those, Matt. You're always working on something interesting, and for people who need to, to keep up with uh, just what you're working on, but you also ask very cool, thought-provoking questions. I love the question you asked the other day of uh, three posters you have you had in your room growing up. And just, I mean, man, that's, that's like a journey to someone, the center of someone's psyche. So what, was, what were the ones you named? What were yours? Uh, three posters that were on my wall as a teenager. Uh, Motley Crue was one. The baseball player, Daryl Strawberry. And the uh, uh, sort of uh, swimsuit model, Elle McPherson, was one of them, too. Oh, beautiful. So. Beautiful. See, me, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Excellent. Which I st- It's the, the original movie poster, which I still have and just put up in my current apartment, despite... Uh, my girlfriend not really wanting it in there. <laughs> she made. Oh, she said like we have to get a new frame for it though. We got to make it look a little bit uh, less childish or something. <laughs> I was like, oh, we don't have to put it in the bedroom. We'll just put it up. You know, I was. Oh, we agreed. It was all right. She. I. I let her put up Dave Matthews posters. Whatever. Or. I. I, I that had, seems like I, a fair I had no choice. Yeah, I had no choice. Ninja Turtles for. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Matthews. I know, uh, but also I. I went. I was born to sports growing up. You know, then, then music. Music came a little bit later. So, um, yeah. uh, Don Mattingly, uh, great, nice, yeah, New York Yankee great, and uh, Patrick Ewing, New York Nick great. So that, two good ones. I ate at Don Mattingly's restaurant in Indiana one time. It's pretty good. Oh, okay. See, I had a lot of sports. I I just named three, but I also remember I had Patrick Waugh. Uh, even though I'm an Islanders fan, I was big into goalies, and, and Patrick Waugh was my favorite. I also think I had Mario Lemieux uh, up there as well. Maybe Ken Griffey Jr. as well. Uh, uh, yeah, Ken Griffey Jr. He was a oh my, wow. He was like he was a god when you were a child. Like I want to be cool like Ken Griffey. That's when you see all these white kids wearing a backwards cap, not looking as cool. <laughs> uh, and before I, I let you go, I'd be remiss if uh, and I, I mentioned it last episode. Thank you for being the catalyst to to get me uh, to get me Pauly Shore Guns and Roses. So th- <laughs> thank you for that. And I want to play. Uh, for one, I don't think you've listened to it. He did a couple just uh, a couple of IDs for me. So if you listen to some yeah, of my, yeah. my my interviews, you hear the person saying, "Hey, this is so and so." You're listening to Appetite for Distortion. So a lot of times they'll just kind of do a straight read of it, which is fine. But I said to Pauly, if you mind just doing it kind of Pauly Shorey, you know, <laughs> and he's like, "Sure, no, I got it." So this is the one. This is the good take that you you will hear on the episode. But I want to play it for you now. Plus, I want to hear it again. Yo, what's up? This is Pauly Shore, and I'm hanging out with my friend. Brando, Brando, not Marlon Brando, the little baby Brando, and you're listening <laughs> into his beautiful podcast, Appetite for Distortion, because I'm in the jungle, baby, and you had it now. <laughs> wow. I don't even know what he's saying at the end. 
I guess he's trying doing the jungle intro, but uh, or something. But yeah, that's awesome. Very polished short. Uh, and uh, nice to help, and glad you got to do that. Thank you. And uh, I have to play the outtake, which is just as funny. Yo, what's up, you guys? This is Polly Shore, Brando's sidekick today, and uh, I'm with him. We're cruising around. We're getting some fresh, some fresh donuts in the Jersey area. So listen to Appetite for Dysfunction, right? Distortion. Distortion. <laughs> Distortion. No, I'll do it again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe acetate for dis- dysfunction might be better. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and why did he say we were cruising for donuts in Jersey? Neither of us are in Jersey, so I don't know. I wanted to play that uh, for you and and the listeners because that was just a, such a fun episode, and I appreciate everybody uh, being as excited as I was for Paulie Shore. I thought people were going to laugh at me that I was so pumped up to speak with Paulie, but he still has a diehard fan base. So that does it for episode 156 of Appetite for Distortion. Thanks for everybody for hanging out with uh, with Matt Wake and I. Uh, we got a Wake and Bake. Maybe we can come up. With, <laughs> you need a morning show on Treasure Radio. Just call it Wake and Bake. Sorry, <laughs> my, I have my brain went somewhere else. Uh, clearly. So uh, if you want to follow uh, is Facebook the best way or Twitter the best way, Matthew B Wake on on Twitter to, to follow you. Uh, yeah, Matthew B Wake on Twitter. Totally. Yep, and and our Twitter uh, at the AFD Show or on Facebook, Facebook dot com slash the AFD Show, and however you subscribe in the iHeartRadio app, Spreaker, Stitcher. Yeah!